Broadcasting from the Tazan Lake Lodge Studio. This is Sporting Journal Radio. <laughs> Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. Now here's your host, Brett Amundsen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another show here. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in on this station right here or by downloading the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts or by watching this on Facebook or YouTube. If you are, make sure you, you hit the like button, leave us a comment, subscribe, follow us, share this with your friends, help us grow this show because the show is for you. We want to make you better in the field, better on the water with tips and tactics and experts and get you prepared. Like we're going to get you prepared for the pheasant opener this week. We got uh, Jared Wickland on the show who's going to be talking about what you might expect when the pheasant opener comes around for us here in Minnesota next week in October 16 and 17. Uh, North Dakota is uh, this week. Some of the other states uh, within the next couple of weeks. In any case, you're going to be walking for roosters very, very soon. So we're going to talk about what what the drought has done for these birds, where the crop harvest is at, what a drought means for birds. Why? When you have a dry, you know, a fairly good winter and then a dry spring, you think, hey man, our birds are our birds are set up, but you need a little bit of moisture. Why is that? We'll find out uh, coming up later in the show. Also, Joe Henry will join us from, from some swanky digs. What's he doing? Where is he at? And what's the fall shiner run like right now on the Rainy River? Well, he will tell us here in just a little bit. Dan Amundsen is right over there. Dan, how you doing? Well, I'm a little confused. Uh, we rearranged this room again. Do I look at this camera? Do I look at you? Do I look at Mika? <laughs> Do I look at Tiny? Tiny, who, Tiny's confused too. Tiny just saw something. <laughs> anyway. But we're doing good. Yeah, we, we're, we're constantly making the show better. We've rearranged the studio a couple of times. Now we got some brand new gear, which uh, inevitably has brought us some technical difficulties. So uh, we're working through them. But in any case, here we go. Who is this week's show brought to us by? Yeah, this week's show brought to us by Lake of the Woods Tourism. Plan a trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Otter Tail Lakes Country, find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Haybell Heights Campground and Resort on Devil's Lake, plan a trip to Devil's Lake at haybellheights.com. I'm sure those snow bears are going to be coming out pretty soon. Onyx Hunt, know where you stand with Onyx. Prairie Sportsman, watch episodes anytime at prairiesportsman.org. Mid-Migration Outfitters, come hunt geese out of the, at the famous Lock Parl Refuge in heated pits and comfortable blinds. Learn more at midmigrationoutfitters.com and Tazan Lake Lodge. Plan a trip of a lifetime to catch giant lake trout and pike at tazanlake.com. So we just got done with our split here in Minnesota. The waterfall was split. Uh, the central zone and the southern zone, only five days this year. That's a change for the southern zone. And just like last year, Dan, during our split, it was hot. Mm -hmm. There was no duck movement. There was no desire on my end to be sitting in a slough somewhere duck hunting. Uh, so I appreciate the split. For the record, I want to go on the record and say I like the splits here in Minnesota because I like hunting later in the season, and we would have shot zero ducks during our split here without traveling a long ways. Where we're at, we didn't have a lot of ducks around, and it was hot. It was too hot. And if you were hunting last weekend like we were, here's something else that the drought has affected. It's uh, dried up a lot of our sloughs, and if you drive around scouting, you'll see some of the sloughs will have a big ring of dry land between the water, dry land, and cattails. Well, what you don't realize is that that's all mud. So if you're going to go hunt, here's what you should expect. Because we went out on Saturday last weekend, and there's our dry land between the water and the cattails. And it looked great from the road. We're like, oh my gosh, we're going to line this thing with decoys. We're going to have a nice, easy walk between the water. No, it was knee-deep, loon, blankety-blank <laughs> that you were walking through. And uh, even Tiny was struggling to get through it at, at some time. So here's, here's what you need to do. If you're going to be duck hunting in the mud uh, at some point here, here are some tips from us to you. For one thing, wear waders that fit. Because if you'll notice, my, me, my waders are about a size too big. So when they get down in that mud, my feet are sliding around. And that mud covers up those waders. And when I pull my foot up to try to get out of that mud, my foot is sliding up out of my waders and I can't get that wader boot out of there. So wear waders that fit, first of all, and then plan on your dog being very, very muddy. As you can see, Tiny got completely covered in the mud. Look at her, watch her rip through this mud though. You can see her crank her down <laughs> as she gets bogged down that mud, she hits a higher gear. 
man, get oh, yeah. over it's here. A, it's a good thing she's only 47 pounds because mm. uh, my 65 pound lab <laughs> struggled <laughs> a couple weekends ago a lot harder than she did through the same kind of muck. Yeah, but that's pretty good. You know, and seeing it, this is really one of her first real duck hunts. And uh, seeing her go back and bring back that widgeon was a pretty cool feeling. <laughs> Look at that mud. So just plan on your dog being real, real dirty when uh, when you get in the truck. So I have a seat. I have a kennel in the back of my truck, obviously, that I was able to put the dog in. And even if they're just a little bit dirty, I got seat covers in the back of my extended cab pickup that I can put the dogs back there and they're not going to get the, the back seats uh, real dirty. Uh, anytime you're hunting with dogs, plan for some injuries. So we had five dogs that we were hunting with, I think, last weekend. So so my buddies, uh, Jason Markula, had his uh, dog Scout, and that's uh, that was a wire hair. Wire hair, long name, I can't remember. Yeah. Sorry, Jason. They're, like when you get into the ugly dogs, the bearded dogs, I forget. Watch your mouth there. Yeah, I forget which ones, which ones they uh, they are. But he's got. Well, we got a video of it. But uh, Scout got injured. Um, stepped on something under that water, a stick or a rock or something, and ended up getting infected uh, in her paw. Uh, so there's George Lyle checking it out right there. So it was a Sunday, and Jason had to make a trip to the vet on a Sunday. So always plan on knowing where the vets are, especially if you're traveling, knowing where the closest vet is. And always, it seems like every time my dog gets injured on a hunting trip, it's always on a Sunday. And that's probably going to cost you a little bit more because it ends up being an emergency visit to the vet or you have to call the vet in. Although most small towns, uh, they get it. And small town vets are the best and they'll usually work with you a little bit, but you're probably going to pay just a little bit more. And speaking of George, he's got that English Cocker Spaniel. And it's one thing I've learned that size doesn't matter. Guys talk about wanting those big brute of a, of a retriever when they're out there chasing ducks. And maybe later in the season, you want those bigger dogs with the heavier coats that are a little bit warmer but we got the 15 pound mini out there retrieving ducks with us last week and it was pretty cool so these are english cocker spaniels and i pheasant hunted with these dogs before and they are machines in the field and uh I, you know i i was real impressed with mini george knows how to handle dogs of course and uh, I, like I said, I've pheasant hunted with him before and watched him do uh, a lot of work, find some birds just in the nastiest, thickest cover. So it was kind of fun to watch that little dog go out there and, and retrieve some of those ducks right there. But maybe my favorite moment was we got to have Mika out there, the old lab, my old lab. She's in her 11th hunting season right now. She's sleeping across the room snoring right now in front of us. But we uh, dropped a green wing teal that sailed out quite a ways and was still alive. So it was swimming. And I was nervous that she was and she was about the only one I really trusted to go out there that far. Like all the other dogs were real young dogs. I couldn't see that bird. But they start diving on you. And thankfully, Mika's got experience with diving ducks like that. So I was curious how she was, how it was going to go. And uh, she got it like a champ. That teal is like, uh-oh, this is not good. This is not good. So it tries, it tries getting away from her right there. And then it never dove, though. It's, I think it tried to dive right there, and Mika caught it before it could dive. So that was, uh, that was pretty neat to see her get that wounded green wing teal right there so if you're gonna go hunting and you're bringing your dogs there's a few tips from us to you uh just be prepare for a lot of mud out there <laughs> and your dog getting real real dirty but you'll find some ducks you might have to travel a little bit we're uh, a little bit of an of a stalling point in the migration right now as we just got warm warm weather but what we've noticed uh we've talked about it in, in the last few weeks is we think the dry conditions have affected the food and the water supply for a lot of these birds so we think a lot of birds have already migrated and probably kept right on trucking just because they don't have a lot of water to, to stick around here maybe some crops but a lot of corn coming up off, a lot of soybeans coming off so hopefully when we get some geese to come back down they'll be able to uh, stick around the area a little bit because they got some food so during our split we decided to go walleye fishing because it felt like walleye weather out there and uh don't ever chance pass up the chance to fish right now here in the fall and we learned something down when we fished the other day uh, we went out a couple of times. The first day we went out, we drove down, bought some minnows, some fatheads, and went back out and fished. And we caught a walleye, and we caught a few fish here and there. And uh, fishing had slowed slowed a little bit, so there weren't a lot of fish getting caught. But we went out the next night, and we got out late, and we we're like, let's just let's just run plastics, you know? We'll just run some gulp minnows or whatever, some um, some tails. 
And we caught more walleyes on artificial, and we were the only ones catching walleyes. All the other guys were using live bait, and we were uh, we were catching more walleyes. We were outfishing guys with live bait with plastics. Sometimes you got to switch it up, you know. And and one thing we kind of learned too is that bigger profile that you know those guys before us catching them on minnows we'd heard were catching them all on chubs uh, and so that i think helped yeah. us too is going to a bigger you know i had a four inch four inch uh plastic on a jig head and so going to bigger going bigger profile and something different how many yeah. chubs and fat heads on well, a jig do you think those fish had seen in the last week and uh so now they're seeing something different and they're hungry they're putting the feedback on so we caught a 19 inch walleye that was fat or well, that's what i was thinking oh the fish is putting on the feed bag so we opened up the stomach to see what that fish had been eating it was eggs like she already had eggs for for the spawn already in her stomach so I, we've been asking a number of people here this week to you know try to figure out like how early do fish start producing these eggs because I, I haven't caught and kept a lot of walleyes in October, so I've, I have, haven't run into this before. And a lot of people I'm talking to were surprised as well that the, those fish were already developing eggs for the spawn here in the beginning of October. So if you catch some fat walleyes this time of year, it might not be from, you know, f f getting that feed bag on for winter. It might be uh, preparing for the spawn already. So we were a little, a little disappointed to see that, but what do you do? There's a legal fish to keep and it's gonna be delicious. Um, and, okay, uh, do we have, but we did catch uh, a couple of nice fish. Oh, we don't have those videos. No. So we got, all right, Dan, I'll go grab it. Dan, talk to the camera about what you <laughs> caught the other day. Okay. T tell us your story. Well, so <clears throat> we're fishing this spot. It, we had, what, been out there, what, 15 minutes maybe? Yeah, it was early. It was early and we're fishing a lake that's got big walleyes. This place has known for big, big walleyes. We'd heard of some big ones caught. We'd seen some big ones get caught. Uh, so we're dragging along and I thought I got snagged. There's a lot of debris in there too, whatever. My rod doubles over, I'm like, ah, snag. So go back, go try to go back over this spot. And all of a sudden I realize I'm picking this thing up. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, we've got a tank of a fish. It's either a giant walleye or a giant carp. We and definitely thought it was a log. Well, I did. I thought it was a fish for a half <laughs> second because you picked this thing up and it came up and then it just bobbed on. I'm like, oh my gosh. But then there was there was no movement to it. So 100% thought log. Yeah. So I started just cranking this thing up by hand and uh, came up to, to nothing I would have ever guessed, uh, a wrench, a spud wrench. So this is a spud wrench. And this is what I saw first. And I was like, okay, he caught a wrench. That's really weird. But when you turn it like this, it's got a little different profile and then it's got a pointed in at the bottom. So then I wasn't completely sure what it was. So after doing a little bit of research, it's a spud wrench and iron workers, <coughs> Tiny really thinks this is a stick, a stick to play with. Iron workers use this and uh, they use it to when they build bridges. So this was, I don't know how long this has been in the water, but there has been a bridge. Uh, we were fishing near a bridge that has been there for many, many years. And if you wonder about the pointed end, so that's used to line up two holes. So when they're putting two pieces of you know steel or, or whatever together and there's a hole and they need to line up the two holes, you can put that through and you can kind of line her up. So yeah, anyway, there it is. It's an old spud wrench and we're gonna try to clean it up and try to figure out how old it is. But you can see somebody else got tangled on it at one point. And I don't know if you caught, you probably caught I that I caught line. the line, yep. yeah. No way my this. little eighth ounce jig was biting <laughs> into that thing. But it's either that or it could be a murder weapon. Oh boy, okay, Tiny, you can have it. <laughs> I don't want it anymore. But Ty, Dan has caught a little bit of history there. So you never know what you're gonna pull up in some of these lakes. And it's uh, kind of cool to learn a little bit about the past. And one story that I wanna just share here real quick before we wrap things up is uh, Kevin Wallavan, who's a, a friend of mine a reporter tiny we're trying to do a radio show here hang on just a second he shared some on facebook the other day that i thought was pretty interesting and it's the oldest set of skis in the history of of skis it's the oldest known set of skis that we've uh that anybody knows about so it was uh they were found in norway one ski was found in 2014 and then here, the, just the other day, they found the second ski uh, encased in ice and frozen on the side of a mountain. 
and it's a wooden ski. We're going to try to pull up a picture of it here. It's a wooden ski complete with bindings and the whole thing. So it's not like just a piece of wood that they found and said, oh, this looks like a ski. Like it legit is a ski and they figure it's from before the Viking age. Like how crazy is that? 1300 years ago, they figured these skis are from which I don't know how they did they ask somebody they probably asked. they googled it yeah. you know how do you how do you know but they they know they find their ways and they can tell by the tools and the the, the objects used and whatever probably some carbon dating whatever but um, it was it's uh, it was pretty pull that back up there Dan and let's let's show those skis again real quick yeah so they were trying to figure out why they were there and there was a nearby viking village there's a trail that went through there but what i thought was pretty cool is it's a it was a well-known reindeer hunting location so they were probably there on skis hunting reindeers and uh who knows either somebody left them there forgot them there maybe somebody died there could have died it's hard to say but anyway the oldest known skis in history 13 years old all right it's time to talk pheasants and the upland season uh we're going to do that with uh, jared wickland from pheasants forever here in just a couple of minutes but when we come back we're going to talk to joe henry <laughs> from lake of the woods tourism after i settle my dogs down Devil's Lake is legendary, and this summer has been legendary for walleyes. Don't miss out. Call Hay Bale Heights Campground and Resort today to book one of their modern cabins on East Bay. The cabins are furnished with a full bathroom, kitchen, and all the amenities like high-speed internet and are clean following CDC guidelines. Staying at Hay Bale Heights gives you full access to a private boat launch, fish cleaning station, and beach area. Learn more at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Plan your trip to legendary Devil's Lake today. All right, welcome back. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in right here, wherever you're viewing slash listening to this. I appreciate it. We're going to talk fishing right now, and we're going to talk Lake of the Woods and walleyes with Joe Henry. Uh, Joe with Lake of the Woods Tourism, and he's, he's at a tourism conference right now. I'm going to find out where he's at uh, right now. But, Joe, I just want to mention, we were out fishing the other day, and uh, we were fishing next to a boat with, with – it was somebody that I know in that boat, and he goes – Hey, you gonna have Joe Henry on this weekend talking about the fall shiner run on uh, on the Rainy River? <laughs> I said, yeah, we probably will. Well, good. So we're, we're, the word's getting out, and the shiners are running. So let's let's bring it up, right? That's right. And they've been running for for a little while now, haven't they? They have. Yeah, they started they started running early, and you know, every year is different. I mean, some years you don't know if they're going to run and then stop and then run and then stop or they're going to keep running and but you know we've had a pretty consistent run this year and you know consequently there are walleyes in the rainy river and uh it's it's been going good you know and um the, the other thing that's interesting too is you know um lake of the woods and, and, and other bodies of water too but lake of the woods has kind of a, a seasonal fall movement of walleyes and we kind of know that, that they move to a certain spot and i'll tell you this the water temps are a lot warmer than they normally are the water temps are in the mid 50s and normally they'd be in the 40s right now and but with that being said, you know, those fish, they, they, their behavior is based on a lot of things. It's based on, you know, um, where the food is. Um, it's based on water temps. It's based on length of day. It's based on current. I mean, there's a lot of things that affect walleyes. And the bottom line is this, is that they have start, they have moved into many of their fall haunts. So, for instance, you know, out in front of the Rainy River is Pine Island, and then that's part of the south shore of the lake. Well, all across the south shore of the lake, there's been pods of walleyes, nice schools of walleyes bite. And I'll give an example out in front of Pine Island in 28 to 30 feet. You can go out there right now and find good pods of walleyes, anchor up and just jig over the side of the boat. So easy, it's so relaxing. It's, it's just a fun bite. Um, I got some friends that were uh, a little bit shallower water trolling cranks. And uh, in fact, there's a picture. And you know, uh, uh, they did really, really well pulling crankbaits. Uh, not, not a lot of people would think about pulling cranks in the sure. fall in the colder water, but you know you can pull cranks. Uh, heck, can we pull cranks when there's still ice on the rainy river in the spring? So sometimes you just slow down, maybe go to a more subtle wobble. It just depends. Uh, but yeah, no, fishing's been good. People are also catching some fish. Out of fairness, I'll mention the third technique, and that's you know still pulling spinners, and they've kind of shifted over to minnows on those spinners rather than crawlers. And you know all three techniques are working. There's there's uh, structures working so you can find different reefs on the lake of the woods and there's fish holding there just the certain reefs not all reefs but certain reefs and then of course you know the third spot is up at the northwest angle and of course up there i mean for people that are fishing minnesota they're catching good fish that's been very consistent for people sliding into ontario it's been stupid good because of the islands and uh, just you know those fish are kind of left alone for a couple of summers so 
Uh, the musky bites is going, smallmouth being caught. You see a couple of crappies there that were actually caught in the basin. Um, you know, crappie fishing up at the angle is kind of a, a fall thing. You slide up into Ontario and fish deep points and things like that. And if you get into them, boy, they can be some darn nice crappies. So re really some good fall fishing going on right now, Brett. And I'll tell you what, it's gonna, it's probably, it's probably gonna get better uh, as we get colder. And you know, that'll be all the way up until uh, ice in. And you know, most people, by the time deer hunting hits, it's pretty cold out and people go deer hunting. There's not a lot of fishing that goes on after deer hunting, but I'll tell you this much, for the hardcore walleye angler, we always see those, there's always some 13 pound fish caught right around that deer hunting opener when everybody's in the woods. Well, I'm heading up to Lake of the Woods here next week, and I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to hit up Chad Malloy for some tips there. Apparently, he was just up there catching some nice fish. It looks like. Yeah, he, he was catching some really nice fish. Yeah, and he uh, he messaged me those pictures, you know, and uh, again, he was pulling cranks, which I thought was you know unique. But I mean, mm. pulling cranks is always a good technique. And uh, they they had uh, 50 fish. Two guys had 50 fish before noon. Wow. Give an example. Now Dang. it's still fishing, so you could go out and. and uh, Maybe not find those fish the next day. Maybe those fish have turned off a little bit, aren't that hot and heavy. But normally on Lake of the Woods, if you're willing to move around a little bit, you're going to usually run into something good. So, Joe, let me ask you this question because we kept a 19-inch walleye the other day. It was nice, fat, healthy 19-inch walleye, and we were real excited because, hey, you know, like that 19-inch, I don't like to keep them you know, bigger than that. So when you get a nice 19-inch, that's a real nice fillet. And we opened her up, wanted to see what she was eating. And here was all eggs inside there. Oh, yeah. At the yep. beginning of October. Doesn't that uh, seem a little early? Yeah, you know, maybe I, I, I don't know the stats on when they actually start producing eggs, but I mean, you know. Uh, the, the, I couldn't find I it. it. I did search. I searched the internet for that. I couldn't find the info. So, Interesting. I don't know. The, the one thing I will say about a 19 inch wall is that, you know, we're a, a, a lot of us think that we're pretty fortunate to have a slot limit up a lake of the woods mm -hmm. and you know some people will be critical of it they'll say you know i'm not going to lake of the woods because i can't keep a 22 inch wall you know and mm -hmm. and the way we look at it is, is this is that you know the reason that this by the way the slot limit for your listeners uh, it's 19 and a half inches to 28 inches you must release that walleye and then you're allowed to keep a combination of six fish up to four of those can be walleyes and you're allowed to keep one walleye over 28 for the wall if you'd like and you know, <clears throat> the reason it's 19 and a half is because that's when a walleye on Lake of the Woods, a female walleye bee can, can reproduce. So what we're doing is we're taking our reproducing walleyes, 19 and a half to 20 inches, and keeping that breeding stock in the lake. I promise you this, if things were different, if, if, um, if people could keep those fish, there'd be a lot of those fish, the majority of them in fact, going in coolers back home. And, uh, you know, when we talk about 2.7 million angling hours on our ice and, and t the, the new technology and fishing and bigger boats and bigger motors and, you know, it's important to have some sustainability to a fishery. So we're, we're fortunate, I think, that we have that. And look at the fishery we have. I mean, you know, people are catching all different size fish right now. They're catching trophy fish, picture fish. They're catching eaters. I mean, and they're catching small ones, which is great for the future. So we're, we're pretty excited about it. You're in a much, much fancier location than you normally are in, Joe. What are you saying that this fancy location is as fancy as my home office? <laughs> yeah, you got, you got a fire behind you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not nice. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I'll just show you around a little bit here. I'm in a lobby of a renaissance in Bloomington here and uh, mm. just about to take off for my meeting. But yeah, I know we had a we had a, some tourism meetings. You know, we. Uh, We'll get together the Minnesota Association of Convention and Visitor Bureaus, and it's uh, tourism leaders from around the state. Um, and we get together and we, you know, we network. We uh, we have education, we have industry updates, we have legislative things, and the legal aspect of of tourism and what's happening. And we have lobbyists and and uh, yeah, so it's uh, we do this twice a year. We get together in uh, in October and also uh, get together in June. So it's uh, it's a good way to get together from a tourism perspective, and uh, it's it's part of what you do within the industry. There's you know, it's not all fishing. I uh, People, people say that I fish all the time. It's all I do is fish. And <laughs> the funny part of what it is, I, certainly my passion, and I do get to fish once in a while, but, you know, there's so much more that goes on behind the scenes, like anything, you know, like any job. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if people want to do, uh, if people want to take part in the tourism up at Lake of the Woods, Joe, maybe plan a trip for this fall yet, or maybe come up this winter, what should they do? You, you know what, Brian, I'll just say this. Hey. The Rainy River, shoot, bring your own boat. I'm 14 foot boat works. Jump in with a with a, uh, a charter boat or uh, going with a guide. 
you know what? Check out our website. Everything is there. It's lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Northern Minnesota's Walleye Factory is a year-round world-class fishing destination. The perfect getaway this summer is just a short drive to Lake of the Woods. Fish Big Traverse Bay, the Rainy River, or visit the unique Northwest Angle. To catch big fish, you have to go where the big fish are. Plan your trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. That's lakeofthewoodsmn.com. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in to the uh, show wherever you're listening, whether it's on this station right here by downloading the podcast or by streaming on demand at sportingjournalradio.com. The pheasant opener is uh, here for some of the... uh, some of the people around the area tiny is very excited about it obviously and then uh, october 16 and 17 is when we're going to open up in minnesota and also wisconsin opens up for pheasants as well too so of course whenever we talk pheasants we got to have jared wicklin public relations specialist with pheasants forever on the show jared how you doing hey brett great thanks uh thanks for having me on it's been a, a fast start to the fall and we're getting close to the favorite time of year for upland hunters which is a great thing now, hunting season has been open uh, in some sort of another or, or another so, some form of hunting seasons have been open somewhere. And uh, of course, we've been taking advantage of it. So have you. And I'm real jealous about one hunt you went on. You went elk hunting recently. Yeah, I went on a Western uh, elk hunt with my father. And I think if COVID taught us anything or taught me personally anything, it's that you just can't wait to do those types of trips because you just you, you just don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow. So my dad and I are uh, just real good hunting buddies. We have been. He's the one that mentored me as a kid. And we went out west, and he shot a beautiful, beautiful bull elk, uh, a very large one. And I ended up taking a, a cow elk at about 125 yards through dark timber and turned out to be awesome. Uh, came home. Uh, I've shot a few geese and uh, shot, uh, shot a nice limit of – uh, rough grouse this past weekend on an anniversary trip up the north shore so yeah it's been a incredible start to the season and and uh doing it with loved ones i think makes it makes it all the more special yeah absolutely how was grouse hunting did uh you were able to see them a lot of leaves are still on the trees up there yeah there's there's still a lot of leaves and i was kind of going between my, my my pointer and the lab um and the the pointer sort of won out especially for early season to give you an idea it's, that, that the bird is there. And, you know, obviously the lab's got a, got an easy tell to her. Like I, I, I know when she's on a bird and, and she goes in and flushes it, but yeah, it's just having a pointer early season, I think makes all the difference. And, uh, I really like hunting with the flusher as we get later in the season. She, she works, you know, 20 yards and in, and, uh, that that's plenty close for, for getting grouse, uh, once the leaves are down. So it, it worked out well. They both did great. They both got in the birds and both got to retrieve a little bit. And, uh, yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful time on the North shore. The leaves haven't quite peaked yet though. Um, still a lot of leaves up and, and not as much color as I actually thought there was going to be. So that was kind of interesting. interesting. I'll tell you what, man, I love my labs, but, uh, the more I, the more time I spend, uh, chasing upland birds around, the more, <laughs> the more I want to get a pointer, Jared. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, my first bird dog, Coda, who you you hunted with before she passed away uh, from cancer. Um, you know, I've always loved hunting with Labs and and Luna, who I have now, is great. But uh, Jackson, I got from my father when they moved down to Tucson, Arizona, and he just didn't have uh, enough enough time to dedicate. And uh, he's he's been a real godsend for, <laughs> for my for my upland hunting efforts. Um, he I, I haven't put much. He's kind of just natural talent. Haven't put much time. An effort into him but uh he holds point pretty good uh he's a heck of a retriever for being an english pointer uh which some people can't uh claim and uh yeah it's it's been a great season thus far and the, the pointer has been a big part of it well obviously i do a lot of duck hunting and uh you know george lyle right um i do i do have runnings right yeah so we hunted with george last weekend and uh he's got that english cocker spaniel mini 
Which I always thought it was Minnie, like M I N I, because it was ti- like tiny. Mm-hmm. Like I thought it, that's why I called her Minnie. No, it was M I N N I E, so I spelled As her name wrong. Minnie Mouse. Right, spelled <laughs> her name wrong on social media, but tiny little dog. And I, I've seen, you know, we both know a few people that have those for pheasant hunting. I've seen those dogs, they're, they're amazing. Uh, yep. But it was, it was fun to watch her uh, go retrieve teal in the water, too, you know? Uh, was, <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go, right there. I'm there it is. Right there. But, um, yeah, so that that's kind of fun, and I I don't know, like I, I it every year I say I want to get I want to add a pointer to the mix, and then I just end up with labs. So uh, we'll see. Oh, maybe we'll see. maybe one of the maybe one of these years have changed your mind. You know, I, I've always thought about when the English pointer goes away. Um, I've kind of looked at small small moonster landers a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I've thought about uh, drawthars. Uh, look, I'm kind of. Kind of looking for maybe something a little different. I'd like to get a pointer. I really like the pointer lab mix, and uh, yeah. I think you would too if you got one. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, let's talk pheasants. Um, yes, sir. The drought really affected things this year. Uh, maybe just real quick, talk about how droughts affect pheasant numbers. Well, really, you know, dry, drier weather is good for pheasants to a point, and I think that's uh, that's something a lot of upland hunters don't don't quite understand. You, you think, we, you know, there's a, a generalization out there when pheasants come through an easy winter, um, populations are going to be way up, and that's not always the case. And and this year might be one of those, especially with drought. So it affects a, a number of different things. Number one. Uh, if it's hot, uh, it can affect the eggs a little bit. There's not much research out there uh, pointing to that as far as, you know, what, what temperature affects them uh, or, or maybe the hens come off the nest. Um, the other one would be grass production. Um, you know, uh, height of grass, that's 16, 18 inches, you got to have it uh, and for, for good nesting purposes. Uh, but the big one is bug production. When you don't yeah. uh, have enough moisture and you don't have enough, uh, you know, grass growth or habitat growth, it affects bug, bug production. And what those chicks eat for their first couple months of life is 100% soft-bodied insects. And if you don't have that, um, it can be a very disastrous situation uh, for pheasant broods. So that's kind of what we we're looking at this year. And then You've also got the roadside counts as well, uh, which, you know, they're done in August where there's typically dew on the landscape and um, DNR volunteers are driving routes and and counting pheasants and their broods and flushing them to see how many are there. Uh, But when we have dry weather like we did this year, we had dry, smoky weather uh, in August. Um, you know, the, the roadside counts were down, but the DNR did say in there, and it's, I, I would agree with them that it might not tell the whole tale of what, what the pheasant abundance really is in the landscape due to the fact that those birds didn't need to come out to roadsides uh, as much with, without as, as any dew that we had. So that, it'll be an interesting year because I've, I've heard mixed results from people. I've had uh, a buddy who farms a thousand acres down in southwest Minnesota saying he's seen oodles that's the word he used oodles of pheasants um so and i've had other people that have you know hunted or uh, done the roadside counts where the count that they submitted they went back and did it a couple days later uh and they saw you know 20 30 more birds per route so it's hard it's hard to say and then lastly i'll point out is that um there was evidence from the from the dnr um Tim Lyons was telling me on a, a call that we tried to have earlier today uh, that they had evidence of hens nesting in the en- end of August, early September. And I guess mm-hmm. I would see evidence of that around my house for a brood that my, my wife showed me a picture of the other day or a video. Um, they, they weren't colored out yet. They weren't fully mature. Um, and that could be a saving grace for pheasant hunters here in the fall of 2021. Yeah, I definitely saw more broods later than I did earlier this year so uh, hopefully they had a little more nest success later in the year obviously the egg numbers go down when they when they do that but um yep. lots of I've, I've been hearing a lot of crowing and uh, a lot of roosters too. in the morning so um that could mean a couple of things of course it could may mean for some tougher hunting too because some of those might be adult birds that have made it through and uh, have played the game once or twice already <laughs> yep. little, little, little bit more little bit more savvy roosters out on the landscape yeah it's it's going to be an interesting year overall you know i think 
The other aspect people are talking about is with the drought, uh, we had more haying and grazing of CRP mm -hmm. acres, especially on private lands, maybe some walk-in lands as well. Um, so these, these honey holes that people have gone to in the past, um, they might be totally gone. They might be partially gone. Uh, it's hard to say, but I think you're going to early season, you're going to see, uh, all of the hunters that come out, especially for the first three weekends of the season are going to be combined into kind of a little bit smaller areas. Uh, but I, I really think the late season, the late season hunters, the veterans this, uh, this year are, are really going to get some good pheasant hunting as, as we get some, some snow and some cold temperatures. That's when I like to go when there's some snow on the ground and uh, get out there and hunt a little bit and you have a little bit more access to some of the public lands there's not as many hunters out there and uh i don't know i just like I, I like cooler temps i like being out there later in the season for everything honestly i like later season duck hunting i like later season uh pheasant yep. hunting my deer hunting i my, my bow hunting isn't as successful later season so i like to do that a little bit earlier but <laughs> Um, when it when it comes to some of that um, that haying and grazing and some of that emergency stuff, obviously that's happening on private lands too. There seems like there's some more haying because there maybe some crops weren't planted in certain areas. And then we watched a lot of sloughs get plowed up here this spring too, uh, for for good or for bad. I mean, I I understand why the farmers are doing it, but I I watched a couple of good sloughs get plowed up um, that I know of held pheasants in the past. But uh, I can't can't fault the farmer for trying to reclaim his land a little bit, but it's just unfortunate to lose some of that habitat. But then with some of these really dry conditions, man, there's going to be a lot of sloughs that you can walk these days that have been like, I don't know, I, for, up until last year, the previous probably four years, I just planned on being wet the entire time I was pheasant hunting. I planned on going <laughs> breaking through yeah. ice. My boots would fill up with water. I was constantly wet and just dealt with it. Last year, I hunted in my slip-on shoes for, for a good part of the season, and I have a feeling it's going to be that way again this year. So it's going to be, uh, you're going to be able to access some areas you might not have been able to in years past. I think there's a there's a huge difference. I think a lot of people remember the fall of 2019 when we got a whole bunch of rain followed by a huge dump of wet snow. I believe that was in October. Mm -hmm. um, and we had more dumps of wet snow after that. And the sloughs never really froze over. So a lot of people, uh, myself included, when, you know, you're five foot eight on a good day, um, <laughs> trying to go out, trying to go out and walk cattails with the worry of falling through. You don't know how, you don't know how deep some of those are. You're out there by yourself. Um, so I always caution people, if you're hunting late season by yourself, make sure you know where you're going. You got to make sure some of those areas uh, are are frozen solid because you just don't know how deep they are if you're just hunting them for the first time. But you're absolutely correct. The drought, um, you know, mo most of the areas around my house with the drought, there's cattail sloughs that have been wet for the last seven years since I moved in here and they're completely dry right now. So there's going to be just some pretty big opportunities to reach reach places and some of those, what uh, I think some people refer to as hell holes. Um, and th th that's where the birds are going to be. But you're going to be able to reach them this year, I think, um, in an easier fashion due to, due to the drier conditions. Well, I was definitely expecting the uh, pheasant season to open up on, on uh, October 9th this year. Uh, but it's October 16th and I've been able to, I'm sure it's some sort of state statute where the opener has to be on close Saturday closest to whatever, but I can't figure out why we're opening up on the 16th this year. But in any case, I have a feeling it's going to be like last year, Jared, where a lot of those crops are out prior to the opener. There's crops coming out all over the place this year too. So I think, uh, I think there's going to be more birds in the grass for hunters on opener. Yeah, talking uh, talking with biologists, talking with farmers and, and friends of mine that are in the agricultural sector, um, crops are coming out of the field and they're they're pretty well dried down in some places already. So you're absolutely right. I mean, they're going to need that extra time uh, to 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 dry out in the field. So if they're pulling it out right now. Uh, I would imagine there's going to be a lot of a lot of corn harvest. Certainly, bean harvest is going to be done, uh, but corn harvest as well is going to be ahead of schedule this year. Uh, and that means that means good things for for early season if we can get most of that out of there and not have a place for for those birds to go and hang out for the day. All right. What about um, the Dakotas, uh, maybe Iowa or Wisconsin? What are what are the other states around Minnesota? Uh, gonna see maybe for their openers you think and there's their seasons 
Yeah, I know. I think I think Iowa this year uh, is going to be strong again. Uh, their roadside counts overall were a little bit down, uh, but there were some regions that were significantly up, uh, especially the West Central and Northwest regions. And little anecdotal story, I actually went went down to check out a land acquisition um, in, in northwestern Iowa, western Iowa, uh, a couple weeks back, uh, especially when the, the hay and grazing really started to get going at the beginning of beginning of August or middle of August. And, um, you know, hay and grazing is part of the game. And we we, su- we support that uh, from the conservation side. There's got to be some take and give. And CRP, not only has it been great for, for wildlife, water quality and soil health, but it's also acted as a safety net for farmers and ranchers over the years. And when we have drought, um, it's one of the viable feed sources out there. But on my trip down to Iowa, uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of haying going on, uh, but behind each one of the bales, it seemed like every other bale, there was a brood standing behind it. So (laughs) the CRP did its job. Um, the Eastern side of the state, I think saw a little bit downfall this year. They had some pretty tough weather conditions. Uh, you know, over 30 inches of snow, followed by a lot of ice, and uh, they had those really cold temperatures for two weeks. But um, Iowans are going to have a, a, a good season this year in particular parts of the state. Um, South Dakota, I think there's going to be more broods out there than what people imagine. There has also, same, all these states are, uh, there's not really any difference between them. There's been a lot of hay and grazing going on. Um, South Dakota saw some uh, pretty unique, uh, heavy drought conditions uh, throughout the summer. Uh, but folks have talked with, uh, especially when they started their, started some of their, uh, taking some of the grass off, uh, you know, for cattle ranchers, uh, they were seeing more broods than they thought they'd see. So that's good. Mm. And, uh, you know, North Dakota's kind of fallen suit. They, they didn't have much, much rain this year. Um, and, uh, I think they were down overall, um, for their pheasant counts, but, um, there are certain areas there. I, I would encourage people to take a look at, uh, you know, weather maps or uh, precipitation maps throughout uh, throughout the summer, and those areas that had localized events where they had normal rainfall, um, that that might be one of the keys to finding where there's going to be some pretty good uh, pheasant hunting opportunities this year. Wisconsin's got some different things going on over there. They they do a lot of pheasant stocking, so I know some places you can actually shoot hens in some of these areas. So I, I assume that's obviously because they're just all released birds anyway. Um, they open October 16th. Uh, limit is one rooster on opening weekend, then two the rest of the year. What What's going on in Wisconsin, and why don't they have more wild birds over there? Wisconsin's interesting, you know. Um, I've talked to some of our biologists and members to hunt, uh, you know, the western side of the state where they have their uh, actual wild populations, uh, or the, their largest wild populations, and uh, people do act, do pretty good over there, wildlife management areas, but in particular, uh, waterfall production areas. But you're right, they do offer um, stock birds in some of those locations. It really comes down to grass cover. Uh, when you look at Wisconsin and you start kind of going east from there and look at some of these other states, when you look at the amount of CRP acres they have compared to places like Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas, Kansas, Nebraska, um, it really tells the full story right there. Uh, pheasants are a grass grassland bird, and when you put uh, grasslands with uh, some type of agricultural crop, particularly grains, uh, pheasants do well. Um, parts of Wisconsin, they just don't have enough grass cover um, to provide to provide the whole suite of, of habitat that the birds need, um, and particularly CRP. I'd have to look and see what the number is, but um, I know they don't have nearly as much as, as some of the surrounding states, and that's that's pretty telling of the the pheasant population as well. But they do have them in pockets. Um, and we are still doing plenty of work over there. We've got great chapters in Wisconsin. The largest land acquisition we've ever done in the history of Pheasants Forever is located in Wisconsin, and we mm. continue to do acquisition efforts. So Wisconsin's got some good things going for it, and uh, they, need, they need more grass on the landscape, and we can help with that on, on public and private lands through our biologist program that we have uh, in, the, uh, in the dairy state. When you talk about hunter numbers and you hear about declining license sales and this and that one of the biggest issues i think or when you ask somebody why aren't you a hunter why don't you go uh one answer i hear a lot is access and and access to places to hunt and i think that's the beauty of pheasant hunting is you don't need a lot of land to do it 
You don't need a lot of gear to do it. You don't need to get up at 4 a.m. and set a thousand decoys. Uh, you don't need a dog. I certainly think, I don't know if I would go without one personally. I think you, you it helps to have one, but you don't need it. Dogs help. It's, it's one of the, it's one of the, you know, aside from dove hunting, realistically, it's one of the easiest things, easiest hunting opportunities you have out there. Sometimes you just don't have places to go. So opening up that public land uh, helps uh, helps take away one of those barriers of entry for maybe somebody that's looking to uh, get into hunting and and uh, go out and experience something. And that's one thing, obviously, that you guys do is acquire land and open it up to, to hunting, pub, you know, the hunting public. How, how many acres of that, you know, in Minnesota, how busy have you guys been acquiring land? Well, let me preface it a little bit in that in the last 12 months, Pheasants Forever actually added the word uh, access or public access to our to our mission statement because we we've been doing it since 1982. So um, throughout the nation as a whole, uh, we've conserved uh, about probably a little bit more now than 200, 212,000 acres. So that's the equivalent of 331 square miles for pheasant hunters to go out and explore. It's a lot of land. If you were to just just the outside of the acres, um, if you're just explore the, the boundaries of those acres, it would take you all the way from Canada down to the Mexico border. So yes, um, access uh, really, really is the name of a game to get more people outside. And in Minnesota, um, when you talk about the legacy amendment where we voted to tax ourselves in 2008, and that money goes into a pot that's split a couple different ways, but um, you know, through outdoor heritage funds and the things that we're doing in Minnesota, in this state alone, uh, we've conserved over 60,000 acres. Um, mm. And this past past year, I had the opportunity during COVID um, to, to get my truck and go uh, visit a whole bunch of wildlife management areas and waterfall production areas and take pictures, uh, write descriptions, uh, acres, funding partners, those types of things. And uh, we've, we've come up now, we've published a land acquisitions map on our website. Um, if you go to pheasantsforever.org, and go to the conservation tab uh, and go to public land acquisitions map. Um, you can see there on the screen in front of you, it's um, divided out, uh, I believe, well, there's waterfall production areas and wildlife, wildlife management areas. And you can click on them and uh, shows you everything you need to know. Um, you can go to a satellite view. You can use the aerial view uh, from the roads, road system to figure out how to get there. And as you zoom in further, it's integrated with the DNR's map so you can see what other public lands uh, are mm. close other than the ones that Pheasants Forever has purchased. So we hang our hat on that um, with our Call of the Uplands campaign right now. In the next five years, we're looking at doing 75,000 acres of permanent protection. Um, Minnesota is obviously going to be a, a big part of that as well. And uh, yeah, access is, is what we hang our hat on. And it's one of the reasons why people are members of Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever. Access is something that uh, it's gonna be there forever and it's open to anyone to go out and recreate, bird watch, uh, or just hang out and watch mother nature at its best. I like to watch birds in front of my gun barrel personally. But, uh, <laughs> That's hey, the other one. That's pull, the other one too. Pull that map back up, Dan. Um, and click on one of those areas. So is that your handiwork? Is that your photograph right there then? Uh, that might not be mine personally. We did, we did have some, uh, in the bank already, but oh, went okay. out and if you go kind of down by the, uh, Mankato area or straight out 55, I took a, took a lot of those photos, but, uh, um, all of the, uh, descriptions on there is uh, a little bit, a little bit of my handiwork. So. Nice. Um, pretty, pretty proud of the map and, and proud of our staff. And it doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of partners, a lot of chapters, a lot of volunteers and a lot of money, but, uh, we're, we're doing our best. And even, even that, even with the amount of acquisition that we've done, um, there's a, uh, there's a public lands map available, uh, on the internet somewhere that shows, you know, in the pheasant range, 94, I-94 and South. Um, you know, most most of these counties in the pheasant range only have, you know, two to six percent public public lands. Um, and we'd, we'd like to add more to that. And obviously we need more. Um, but uh, just goes to show that th there's room to grow and there's landowners out there that that want to work with pheasants forever. And we want to work with them. So if somebody wants to leave a legacy in the future, um, call us. We'd, we'd love to take a look at your property for consideration as a, as a future public lands. 
that's available for Minnesota. Is there plans to expand that to other states then? Yeah, this this map is going to go nationwide. Um, Mm. We've done a whole bunch of work in the state of Iowa, uh, South Dakota. We just did the Kessler game production area up by Pickerel uh, Lake, which is 440 acres, pheasants, grouse, deer all over that. Um, Montana, we've done a lot. Kansas, we've done a lot. Uh, Illinois, we've done a few. Um, Missouri, we just did a huge one this last year. So yeah, we've got we've got acquisitions going kind of all over the place. The East Coast, we've got a few going right now that'll be added to it. So yeah, that that map uh, will be continue to be updated and and uh, get our full amount of acquisitions on there that we've done since 1982. Very good. Well, we should be able to find some birds out there, obviously. Um, might be a little bit older, a little tougher to, to hunt, and hopefully some of these younger birds made it through as well. But either way, I'm looking forward to the season once again, Jared. We should uh, we should go walk through some grass together, get our dogs running around together, chase some birds around at some point here this year. Um, so good luck in your adventures until then, and thanks for being on the show today. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Brett. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.